can follow along in the app or you can turn to 1 Corinthians 15 is where we'll ultimately be today. Um, we're going to start with this uh, question. What if Jesus didn't rise from the dead? And there was a, a book written a couple years ago uh, called When It Was Dark. And uh, the premise basically started with these archaeologists finding this tomb uh, in the outskirts of Jerusalem. And it said, uh, uh, yeah, oh, where's that? Okay. Uh, it, uh, they found this tomb outside Jerusalem. It says, here lies Jesus of Nazareth, the great and good teacher. We secreted his body away in order to place him beyond the reach and rage of his enemies. He was the best of men. May he rest in peace. And the book goes in how this just puts the world into chaos uh, and like all the consequences that come from this. Because when we start to think about it, there are so many people around the world that find so much hope in the resurrection, and rightfully so. Uh, and the truth is, there is some historical evidence that the world would descend into chaos. Uh, there's a uh, when we look at kind of the history uh, of some major uh, you know fundamental pieces of our society, they are so connected to Christianity and the church because it is true. If there is no resurrection, there is no Christianity. If there is no resurrection, there is no church. All right, and if there is no resurrection, it is a different world. When we look at all the major universities that you have heard of around the world, they all started. By the church, they were all started as seminaries, Oxford and Cambridge, and uh, when we look over here, Harvard and Cornell and Penn and Princeton and Yale, all right, these were all, you know, seminaries that began to train people to study God's word, and then eventually they sent it into chaos. Um, hospitals, although Christianity didn't invent hospitals, they didn't invent nursing. Um, nursing was a, a profession started by uh, nuns, all right, and so we... Look at all the hospital groups around here. They all seem to have Baptist or Adventist, you know, history in just our own area. I found this off of Wikipedia, a really reliable source. Uh, but this is what just people, ran, you know, these are just random people put this together. I'm going to read a paragraph in there when you look up science. Most scientific and technical innovations prior to the scientific revolution were achieved by societies organized by religious tradition. Historically, Christianity has been and is still a patron of sciences. It has been prolific in the foundation of schools, universities, and hospitals. Many Christian clergy have been active in the sciences and have been significant contributions to the development of science. Historians of science, such as Pierre Newman, credit medieval Christian mathematicians and philosophers, uh, such as Buridan, Orisme, uh, and Roger Bacon, as the founders of modern science. Protestantism has had an important influence on science. According uh, to Merton's thesis, there was a positive correlation between the rise of English Puritanism and German Pietism on one hand and the early experimental science on the other. Christian scholars and scientists have made noted contributions to science and technology fields, as well as medicine, both historically and in modern times. Some scholars state that Christianity contributed to the rise of the scientific revolution, between 1901 and 2001, 56.5% uh, of Nobel laureates in scientific fields were Christians. <laughs> Events in Christian Europe, such as Galileo, most contemporary historians and science agree with the relationship between science and Christianity and have corrected numerous false interpretations. What we know is that it was Christians that initially said, if, if God is real, we would see an organized, planned universe. Because if God is an intelligent being, we would see intelligence throughout nature. We would see intelligence throughout the universe. We would see intelligent design. And as they began to study this, you know, began to study this world over and over again, they began to prove and show that yes, this world is organized. This world is planned and is intelligently designed. There was an interesting study throughout Europe, oh, me, throughout Africa, that they basically said the countries that had Christian missionaries in the 19th century have, uh, versus the ones that didn't, it's about 50-50, I think it was like 38 had Christian missionaries, 39 didn't. Uh, and from that, uh, the 
Um, countries that had Christian missionaries in the 19th century have higher literacy rates, longer life expectancy, and higher GDP. They relate this to more education, more hospitals, more morality. All right? And now, fortunately, we don't have to think of a world of if Jesus had not resurrected, because fortunately, he did. He did. And that's why I'm going to look at 1 Corinthians 15, and we're going to see all the benefits that we get because of the resurrection. All right? And when we start in verse 15 here, we're starting with this verse we looked at a little bit on Friday, if you were able to make that. It's this, it's this statement, it's this declaration. It's, uh, many people even point to it like as an early catechism. It says, For I deliver to you of first importance, that I also received that Christ died for our sins according with the scriptures, that he was buried and he raised again on the third day according with the scriptures. This idea of according with the scriptures <laughs> is saying that like the church already knows this. Paul is writing this in, in about the mid, mid 50s, maybe as late as 56, 57. Uh, but this is, and Jesus resurrected right around 30 AD. So we're talking maybe 25, 26, 27 years later. All right, within our life, you know, within a normal person's lifetime, within people's memories, that isn't that long ago. You know, when you think of what was 30 years ago, that was the 1990s, okay? Like, I know it seems like, what, 30 years? It was the 70s, right? 1970s? No. Uh, 1990, like, yeah, we remember, we remember stuff. I remember the Ninja Turtles. Uh, I remember that stuff. I remember, I remember G.I. Joe. I remember watching that stuff. Uh, like, I can remember. I, I rewatched uh, the X Men on, you know, Disney Plus, the cartoon X Men. I remember every single episode. Like, there's not a single episode I didn't remember uh, from when I'm a kid. Uh, and they were great. Uh, so, like, they're, and they're, they're starting to continue those episodes again, but that's a different story. Uh, when we look at. The uh, in the collective, this is not something that like Paul is declaring for the first time. This is not something that like Paul is saying, Hey, just so you guys know, Jesus rose from the dead. He's telling him, like, you guys know this, you guys have these scriptures. Because again, this, this hasn't actually been written down yet, it's not scripture once he writes it. He's calling it scripture. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. What scripture is he talking about? He's not, there's not a New Testament yet. The only books that were probably written by this point, potentially maybe Mark, maybe James, uh, I don't actually think that's what he's referring to. It's definitely possible. It's definitely possible he could be referring back to the book of Mark. Uh, but it is also just possible that he's saying, this is what you guys have been saying in your churches for years now. And, and, they, and they knew it. It's like the little kids, they'd come up and like, you know, when they do their little, uh, they would like say the little Bible verses, what the little kids would come up and say, Christ died for our sins, and he rose from the dead on the third day. Christ died for our sins, and he was buried, and he rose again on the third day. And then everyone would clap and say, man, and they'd fill up with their little iPhone ones. Uh, and and it, was this, it was this exciting statement that Paul is grabbing onto and saying, you know this. I'm not teaching something you don't already know, that Christ died for our sins, Buried and raised again on the third day. He goes on to say, and then he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve, Cephas is Peter, uh, and then to the twelve, and then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep, and he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles. Okay? So he, he's going through this little checklist, and he's saying, this Jesus is... Death, burial, and resurrection, it's not something you've just heard. Yes, it's something you've heard. Yes, it's scripture. Yes, you know it. Yes, it's been catechized. Yes, it's been, you can quote that. But he says, this is something that Peter has seen this. Peter is still alive when he's writing this. And then he appeared to the 12. Most of the 12 disciples at this point when this is being written are still alive. All right, and then he appeared to more than 500 people at one time. So this is not just something that his disciples sitting in their upper room, you know, eating whatever mushrooms they had foraged, uh, you know, for food, and saw Jesus. This is something that 500 people at one time had all seen the resurrected Jesus. They saw Jesus. The reason where, you know, it is just kind of a most likely thing. The most likely place where Jesus was uh, crucified it is right on this, uh, in the road that comes from uh, 
Jaffa, which would be present day, um, like Tel Aviv. Down from Tel Aviv, down from Jaffa or Jaffa, all right, into the city of Jerusalem. So everybody, when they are going home, all right, are kind of coming in on, on a Friday, you know, work, work gets out, and you're coming home, and everybody's passing by this center thing, whichever way you're going, if you're going down south, you're going, you're going to pass by the place of the skull or crucifixions are happening. The whole city was abuzz with what was going on with Jesus. And everybody saw him die. And they went home. And when they come back out after Sabbath, and they start hearing these rumors of Jesus has resurrected. And they start gathering around. There's a time where at some point in that little last, you know, few days he was here on about 40 days and he was kind of appearing to people. 500 people at one time saw Jesus. This is not something that just a few of his followers were believing. All right, this is something that you could go and find these people. All right, you can go, most of whom are still alive. 30 years ago, most people that you knew 30 years ago are still alive. Some, some are still, some have passed away, but most are still alive. You can go and find these people. This is why Christianity spread so quickly in that first century because it wasn't something like they'd heard in Greek mythology where it was like, so when was this? When was all this Hercules stuff? When was all this Athena? Like, oh, long time ago in a land of myth and legend, you know? Like, this is, huh? It wasn't like what the Egyptians were saying that were like, huh? Have you ever met one of these, like, you know, godlike creatures with godlike powers? Well, no, but the people of old did. This is something that you're like, wait, did you ever meet Jesus? Uh-huh. What? Yeah. No, I, I met him. Like, I, I met him. Like, I, I was with him for three years. What? Yeah, you can go. There's other people, too, that see him. There are. And when they would go to Jerusalem multiple times a year for all different festivals, you could go and meet with people that saw Jesus. And you could talk to them. And they're all telling you the same story. All right? They're telling us they're still alive. And then it tells you it appeared of James. He's not talking about James, uh, the disciple. He's talking about his brother James, his younger uh, half-brother James, and the other apostles. And this is something, this is how we define apostle, is people that saw Jesus face to face. The reason why we don't still have scriptures, the reason why we don't still have, or like new scriptures are being written, the reason why that is because our Bible, our scriptures, our word of God is written by people that saw Jesus face to face. It's by people that met him and talked to him. And so when it says it's making sure you know the people that you can trust with God's word. How do we know this is true? Because there are people that met him. There are people that saw him alive. We have the book of James because James but had Jesus appear to him and all of the apostles. This is how we can verify the message. We're not dealing with something that's third hand and fourth hand. People try to accuse the Bible of like, oh, like, how, well, it's just a book written by men. Uh, agreed. It, it, nobody's saying that it's like a giant hand from heaven came down and like etched things in the rock. That happened once. He did ten of them. Uh, and then he broke that copy and he made Moses write the next copy. Uh, so he is not saying that we don't pretend that God did this with like a lightning pad. We know that human beings wrote it, but it's who these human beings were. They were taught by Jesus. They met Jesus. They saw <coughs> Jesus face to face. This is who is testifying a testimony of what they have seen and heard, what has changed their Life. And it's why we do not have new scriptures, and it's why we reject anything that tries to claim to be scripture written hundreds of years after, you know, Jesus died. Hundreds of years. After. Like, of course not. We are looking at the people. We want as much evidence as we can that these are the people that saw Jesus alive and saw him resurrected. Now, Paul admits, he's like, I didn't, I'm the unique one. And he says, this, this is Paul writing, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, 
I am what I am. I think that's what Popeye says too. I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Though it was not I, but the grace of God was within me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preached and so you believed. So Paul's admitting, he's like, ah, I'm the least of the apostles. Why am I the least? So I spent the least time with him. Why am I the least of the apostles? Because I persecuted the church. All right? And why am I working harder than everybody else? Why am I writing like 10 times the amount of everybody else? And because I, I feel like I have this debt. I, I, I've arrested Christians. I've killed Christians. But Paul is such an important figure, not only in that Jesus appeared to, appeared to him miraculously on the road to Damascus way after everybody else. I mean, this is, we're talking years later. All right, that he appears to Paul on the road to Damascus, showing us that God is still working, he's moving, he is active. All right, he appears to him so that he can then be this apostle. He appears to him so that he can then be this one that goes and writes and shares this testimony. But it, he is this person that reveals the transformational power of God. He takes the most notorious anti-Christian, anti-Jesus zealot that he can find. Paul, the first time we're introduced to him, he's this young man at the stoning of uh, Stephen. So the very first Christian martyr, all right, this man named Stephen, he was a deacon in the church, and he is the first Christian martyr killed. And who's there? Paul, holding the coats, kind of egging everybody on, and they stone him. And Paul takes this trajectory towards you know, getting Christian, like trying to just snuff out this Christian heresy. This, this They called themselves the followers of the way. All right? they, they were these Jewish peoples that followed this very specific teaching of Jesus, and he was trying to snuff it out. And so Jesus takes the most famous, ardent, anti, uh, you know, Christ person he could find, and he transforms it. And he says, if look at, is there anyone that can be more evil than this man? Is there anybody that can be worse than him? So religious in his, you know, in his beliefs, and yet so violent in his actions, so against what I'm doing. And when he transforms him, it is the statement that anyone can put their faith and trust in Jesus. We can always look. If somebody says, like, oh, not me, I'm not a good person. Jesus wouldn't love me. Jesus wouldn't save me. I don't even know if Jesus could save me. The answer we can always bring up, well, have you ever, have you ever like killed a Christian? They're going to usually say no. If they say yes, you know, maybe dial 911 and just don't hit send yet. You know, just dial it in your pocket. You should be able to do that in your pocket. If you can't do it, you've got to practice. If they say, yes, I've killed many Christians. Oh. Uh, you know, but most people are going to say no. I said, well, you know what? Then you're better than the Apostle Paul. Fortunately, it's not about how much evil you have done. Fortunately, it's about that Jesus' death on the cross was so powerful that it could defeat any sin, including the most notorious. And he wanted Paul to be out on this forefront so that it could be a testimony, a living testimony of what God does when he transforms a life. <laughs> He goes on in verse 12, getting into the actual heart of the message that he wants to communicate. So he says, we know the statement. Christ died for our sins. He was buried, and three days later, he rose from the dead. We know this. That is the gospel encapsulated. That is as simple as we can put it. You can't take out any of those words and have the gospel make any sense. All right, we need Christ dying for our what? Our sins. He's buried and he raises from the dead three days later. You take away any of those pieces, it doesn't make any sense. But now he's going to go and explain this. And he explains this starting in verse 12. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? All right, this was specifically, there's kind of a broader and a more specific. Specifically, he's talking to this group of people called the Sadducees. Uh, and they are a sect in Judaism, just like in every every Jewish person is going to be part of some sort of sect. There's Pharisees, there's priests, there's scribes, there's, there's Sadducees, there's Essenes, there's all these little groups. And the Sadducees were a group of people that 
did not believe in any kind of physical resurrection. They believed that, yep, we would get to some kind of spirit, maybe spiritually. There was something, maybe the soul would survive in some way. Uh, but the Sadducees and the Pharisees were on opposite ends of the spectrum. The Pharisees believed there would be a physical resurrection and you would like reign in the kingdom of God forever. Which is true, it's what the Bible actually says. And it's funny, Jesus uses this to his advantage several times. When he's being attacked by everyone, he would drop he would drop the little bomb like, what do you think about the resurrection of the dead? And then he'd let the Pharisees and the Sadducees like argue it out. He could like slip out, all right, you know, so that he could get away uh, when needed. And so this was something that he is specifically speaking to the group of people that don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. But in a broader sense, this is what so many people are struggling with today. Most people, all right, we're, modern scholarship, most people believe a, a, a historical Jesus existed. If you watch you know, a History Channel show or a Discovery Channel show, which isn't any way going to be edifying in any way, almost all of them agree there is a historical Jesus. And then the whole point is, let's find the real historical Jesus. The historical Jesus that didn't do any miracles or anything like that, but that actually lived. Because it's impossible to ignore that there was a person named Jesus from Nazareth that there were people that believed that Jesus raised from the dead, that there were people that followed him and called him to Christ. All right, we know this from Tacitus, was a Roman historian. He talks about Jesus and his followers, uh, the Christians. There's Josephus, a Jewish person that's not a believer, talking about Jesus all right, and all of his followers in the first, by 100 AD. So Tacitus is about 130, uh, Josephus is about 100. Like, there's all sorts of evidence outside the Bible. And why we need to say there needs to be evidence outside the Bible? The Bible is historical evidence all right, of writing at that time. We have evidence that we know when this stuff is written. Again, we have people like Josephus and all these other writers. There's Irenaeus and there's these other writers writing in the early 100s talking about the Bible. And they talk about the scriptures and they mention these books by name. These are historical documents, whether people want to believe them or not. So here is these evidence that we have of people uh, that know that Jesus is alive, that know that Jesus lived. No one argues that Jesus died. There are a hundred out of a hundred historical scholars believe that Jesus died. It's when we get into the resurrection is where there starts to be distinguishing people who believe the message of Scripture versus people that don't. Everybody, I shouldn't say most people believe that Jesus lived. Everybody that believed that Jesus lived believed that Jesus died. That's an easy thing because everybody dies. All right? And now the, the key is, did Jesus raise from the dead? He's saying, I, if there are people saying there is no resurrection from the dead, that that's impossible, that that's miraculous, that that's something God doesn't do, or who even know if God exists, but we don't believe in the resurrection, how can we say that Jesus rose from the dead if you don't believe people can rise from the dead? Verse 13, but if there is no resurrection from the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God, because we testify about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then not even Christ has been raised. And so he's setting up the argument. He is setting up the statement that, listen, if Jesus isn't risen from the dead, we're liars. If Jesus isn't written from, risen from the dead, then God, then we are misrepresenting God. Because we are saying, point blank, that God the Father raised God the Son. We are saying it as clearly as we can state it, that there is resurrection from the dead. That people can rise from the dead, and that Jesus did it, proving it was possible. And if that's impossible, we're liars. If we're liars, we are specifically lying against God, basically saying we're blasphemer, blasphemers. We are in serious, serious trouble. All right? Serious trouble. What's great about Christianity is it has a falsifiable premise of truthfulness. That's a big sentence. All right? It's a falsifiable premise of truthfulness. If the resurrection happened, then Christianity is true. And if it didn't, it's false. We really do hinge 
on this one statement. It's why Paul is taking so much time here in 1 Corinthians 15 to talk about the resurrection. It's why all four Gospels, uh, that there is a long description of the resurrection, exactly how it went down, exactly who saw, and when they saw it, how they saw it, what they saw, when they saw it. All right, because they know the resurrection is the linchpin. If Jesus raised from the dead, it's all true. It's all true. There isn't a miracle that you would say, well, yeah, no, I believe Jesus resurrected, but I don't think he walked on water. That's crazy. Like, there's no miracle that's greater than the resurrection of the dead. No one has a problem with him being able to multiply bread. You know, no one has a problem with him walking on water. No one has a problem with him, you know, healing the sick. Or if he raised from the dead. If he raised from the dead, the rest of that stuff is that's easy. That's child's play. Uh, if he rose from the dead, no, we've never seen that happen. We have seen in the Old Testament Elijah raised a little boy from the dead. And certainly we saw Jesus rise people from the dead. Raise people from the dead. Raise or rise is a tough one. Raise people from the dead. Uh, we saw that oh, several times in Scripture. But you know, we haven't seen who who raised Jesus from the dead. Who rose him? All right, you know who who did this? There isn't a prophet standing up. It's not John the Baptist. He's already dead. All right, there isn't his apostles all standing together, holding you know holding hands and saying, "We're not the guardians of the galaxy." You know, he doesn't like doesn't have anybody that raised him. From he raised himself from the dead. God raised him from the dead. There isn't a prophet that raises him from the dead. He just raises with the power of God. We've not seen that. So if that's true, it's all true. If that's true, everything he said is true. If that's true, everything in the Bible is true. And if it's false, it's all a lie. You can't, if that's not true, it all crumbles. No if, ands, or buts about it. I'm saying, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, there's nothing here. This is nothing. All right? But he did. So we know a couple things from this. The Bible attests to his resurrection. That's easy. Uh, nobody actually argues with that. But the Bible says he rose from the dead. That's easy. The apostles' lives attest to his resurrection. All these people, all these disciples, all these apostles, all start like radically living for Christ. They start sharing the gospel with everyone at great personal cost. They, they all die penniless and tortured for this belief that Jesus raised from the dead. They weren't killed. Stephen's not stoned to death because he believes Jesus died. He's stoned to death because he believed Jesus raised from the dead. Peter and Paul and Rome aren't killed because they believed this guy Jesus died. They're killed because they are saying that Jesus rose from the dead and that he proved that he is the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords. These guys died for their beliefs, and not one of them, when they're being tortured, when they're being crucified, when they're being skinned and boiled alive, ever say, okay, stop that, okay, yeah, that, we made it all up, we made it all up. Peter made me, he threatened me, he threatened to hurt me. Uh, and this hurts way worse than anything Peter would have done to me. So, not one of them lets the cat out of the bag. Not one of them re re recants at the end of their life. Every one of them die horrible deaths except John that gets to live on an island alone the rest of his life. Not one of them says, this is fake, their lives attest to his resurrection. They saw something that changed their lives. Historical records attest to his resurrection. Even the ones that don't believe that he rose from the dead, they're still saying that they have followers that believe in this. So there is record of this being an early teaching. The, the idea that like, well, no, this is all just some kind of myth. This is all just some kind of, this is stuff that develops. You know, like there's other gods that have like rose from the dead in, in Egypt and Greece. Well, this is a common thing. Uh, listen, I'm not denying that there are stories of people that have risen from the dead. I'm not saying there aren't myths of people risen from the dead. The difference is, what you have heard in myths, Jesus did in actuality. What was once a legend that seemed impossible, Jesus comes and fulfills and does the impossible that people have been talking about for generations. Uh, and so the records show that there are people that believe in the resurrection, even if they didn't. 
They're showing that this is the belief of the day, that this is what the issue was. This is the crux of what made a follower of Christ versus what made a rejecter of Christ. I'm sure there were people that kind of like were pretty neutral on Jesus, you know, that they were like, eh, you know, I don't know, you know, I don't know about him. Uh, you know, Pilate is such a great example where he's almost a sympathetic figure because he, he's just trying to keep the peace. And in that trying to keep the peace, he ultimately just gives into what the crowd wants. But he's trying to say, like, listen, I gotta believe this guy, and I'm washing my hands of this. Uh, I, not me. Not, my hands are clean. I'm not killing this guy. You're doing it. All right? and, and there's almost a little bit of sympathy there. It, it still is heartbreaking that you need people that are going to stand up for what is right in the midst of a crowd. That are going to stand up and say, no, I'm willing to get blood on my hands in order to protect the innocent. But he wasn't willing. And again, he's almost sympathetic. But then what happens to him later? You know, I, I think if Pilate is this truly good person, we would read about him again. We would read that all of a sudden, like, he denounced his reign and, you know, was now one of the apostles following Jesus. We don't get that story. And again, it doesn't mean it didn't happen, but maybe we get to heaven and be like, there's some great stories that these guys left out. I'm like, hey, so man, how do you, we don't even read the whole Bible as it is, but if we had another 50,000 stories in there. All right? So, if, if maybe there is something there, I don't think so. I think that would have been mentioned by someone. I think someone would have been like, this is pretty this is the axe. All right? But that's the point. He knows that Jesus died. Does Pilate believe he raised from the dead? I don't think so. I don't think so. If he did, you, you renounce your reign. You were like, I am stepping down, and I am living the rest of my life. It is the point. The followers of Christ believe in the resurrection, and it changes their life. People that didn't believe in the resurrection come up with some kind of excuse, some kind of, I don't know, maybe it was this, maybe it was this other thing. Maybe they're lying, maybe everybody's lying, maybe everybody's lying. Maybe everything is fake. All right? And I don't know. The spread and sustaining attest to his resurrection. Not only do we see Christianity spread throughout the earth uh, really, really quickly, and something that we have not seen, we've never seen anywhere else in world history, have we ever seen a religion jump cultures the way that Christianity did. We have seen religions like, look at, you know, Hinduism pretty much stayed inside of, you know, the Indian subcontinent for a couple thousand years. We look at, uh, um, you know, Islam stayed within Arabic speaking countries for about 900 years. <laughs> so like we, we've not seen something like Christianity where within 30 years, it's not just Jewish people trusting Christ, and then it's Samaritans, and then it's Greek-speaking you know, people, and then it's people all over the world. We see uh, people from Turkey, and we see people from Greece, and we see people from Italy. Uh, we see people from Africa. Uh, we see people from Asia, all trusting Christ within 30 years. We've never seen anything like that. Egyptians believe in the Egyptian gods. And the Scandinavian Viking people believe in their little, you know, bearded gods. Uh, we, we, we see everyone kind of sticks with their own belief. And then maybe after a couple hundred years, it starts to spread a little bit. Christianity, it, it spread unlike anything we've ever seen. And it's sustained. All right? It's not the only proof we use. We're just putting this in the list of things. Christianity is still around. We are still talking about, in English, all right, about a Jewish Israelite living all right, in Asia Minor 2,000 years ago all right, and resurrected from the dead, and we're still talking about it. And this morning, there are people talking about it in Spanish, and there's people talking about it in Russian, and there's people talking about it in Chinese. All right, maybe they're doing it tomorrow. All right, but there are people this morning talking about Jesus' resurrection in, in 1,700 different languages this morning. We still, we still got about 2,500 to go. All right, we still got to do some more work. All right, but there are people, it is still sustaining in languages, in culture, in time. We are still talking about if the Lord waits to return and he doesn't come back for another 500 years, I, I can tell you, I'm 100% in 500 years. We will still be talking about it. 
Uh, there's a little, there's one little sci-fi show that I've always really appreciated, the show called Firefly, that because it was so good, it only lasted like six episodes. Uh, that it, it had in its, like, it, all these little alien races around the universe and all these different things, there weren't actually aliens in the show, all these different colonies all around the, all around the universe, and they're still Christians. <laughs> there are still there are still Christians in all these little outposts all around the universe, and I've always been like, yeah, that's right. If if we go to Mars, all right, if if, if we if you know you know Musk City, all right, opens in Mars, and you know someone like Jason decides to move there because he's like he's bored and he's like I don't really live in Mars, I guess, all right. And when he goes there, there will be Christians in Mars because Jason's there, believe this one, all right. So when in Mars colony, there'll be a church there. There'll be a church there. If we if we put a colony on the moon, there'll be a church there. All right? It won't take long. All right? Because Christianity sustains because the resurrection is true. All right? The changed lives of his followers attest to his resurrection. Today, a proof of this resurrection is that people's lives are still being changed. Again, not any one of these individually can happen in other world religions. I'm not denying that. I'm just simply saying it is a proof. It is a proof that people's lives are still being changed. Your lives are changed. All right? There are going to be, there are going to be people that, you know, that are alcoholics that will never drink again because of the power of Jesus Christ. There are drug addicts that will never do drugs again because of the power of Jesus Christ. There are people involved in all sorts of different sexual sins. There are people that are involved in all sorts of different sordid evils around the world that once Jesus comes into life, will radically change them forever. And they will not sin in that way again. Because the changed lives of his followers attest to his resurrection, that it is real. If we weren't seeing lives change today, we could maybe begin to say, maybe this isn't real. But because we are seeing changed lives, we have to say, maybe it's real. In verse 17, he says, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. All right? And you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Now, when he says here that if Christ has not been raised, you're still in your sins, I actually, I do think theologically there's a little nuance here. I don't think he's actually saying that the resurrection is what saves us. He's saying that the death of the cross is what saves us. Every, every Bible verse we have from the Apostle Paul, what we see in Jesus' own words, you know, it is finished that when he dies, he's, he is saying it is complete, Sin has been paid for. It is the death of Jesus that has saved us from our sins. That he is the punishment that we deserve to face. He faces the payment that we needed to make. He made. All right? That he who knew no sin became sin. All right? And so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The, the death on the cross is what saved us. However, the resurrection is the proof that that happened. Okay? The resurrection is proof that Jesus really did defeat sin and death on the cross. So if the resurrection doesn't happen, it's saying that Jesus, maybe Jesus went to die for our sins and oh, oh, didn't work, didn't work, you know, malfunctioned, there was something wrong, you know, like something failed, something fell apart. Like, if that was his plan, it didn't work if he didn't raise from the dead. Him raising from the dead is the proof that I not only beat sin, because the reason why we die is because of sin. We see from the beginning of Genesis, sin enters the world, now death enters the world. He dies, okay? And in this moment, it's like, did sin get the best of him? Did death defeat him? Death had been undefeated up to that point. Everybody who had died stayed dead. Even the couple people that raised from the dead, they died like. Okay? That, the little boy that uh, Elijah raised from the dead, he died. Lazarus, he died. Okay, They all died. All right? So death was undefeated. And it comes to Jesus, and now it is one for you know, eight billion. All right? One person defeated sin, defeated death. 
And so when Jesus rises from the dead and declaring the world, okay, you don't just have to believe me when I say it. It's not the kind of belief that says, okay, yep, Jesus died for our sins. Yep, you just need to believe that. There is no evidence. There's lots of people who have been crucified. But you need to believe that when he was crucified, it, like, did something super spiritual somewhere, somehow. You don't have to just blindly believe that his death did something. It's in his resurrection that then shows us oh, that death was something special. That death was something real. That death was something, it did something. It, it acted in some way. And so he says that if the Christ hasn't been raised, uh, yep, you're still in your sin. Because we were saying that Jesus died for your sins, if he isn't right, you're, we're lying. All right? And that everybody that has died is just perished. They just, they're just perished. They're just separated from God for all eternity. And he said, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then all we have is hope in this life only. And it's, unfortunately, it's a way that like many atheists look at us and they're like, you know, maybe there's some that are like ardent, it's not good to believe in something fake. And then there's the atheists that are like, yeah, I'm not a belief. They have, it gives them a little bit of hope, who cares? That's fine. I'll believe what they want to believe. Uh, and he's saying, yeah, that's kind of like, they would pity us. Like, oh, they need to believe in, they need to believe in something special. They need to believe in something that there's maybe something beyond this life. <laughs> They're so silly. You know, he's saying, yeah, you're right. We should be pitied. If Jesus didn't raise from the dead, we should be pitied. All right? And we believe, okay? Well, we believe, we believe in Scripture, we believe in Jesus, we believe in the gospel. We believe we will go to heaven because of the resurrection. Okay? That is why we believe we're going to go to heaven. The reason why we believe we're going to go to heaven is here's Jesus saying, I go to prepare a place for you. That, yes, if you believe and trust in me, you will be saved. Uh, that I have this kingdom, this promise. So this is what he's saying. And then he dies, and all of his disciples all react the same way. I feel like we missed something. What does this mean? <laughs> like, I, I, okay, let's hide. I'm scared. I'm scared that we're going to be arrested and killed too. Let's go hide somewhere. The reaction is all the same. Uh, it's a real reaction. It would be our reaction. I don't see us as any different than those disciples that they weren't scared of that. Right? And then when Jesus raises from the dead, game changer. Game changer. We see something totally different. It takes a little bit. But, you know, when we see these very scared, you know, fishermen and tax collectors and, you know, those random people, when we see these little fearful people all of a sudden become some of the greatest witnesses the world has ever seen, we see Peter standing up at Pentecost. Peter, of all, he's standing up on his soapbox and starting to preach to everybody that, like, yes, what you have heard about Jesus is true. David talked about it. Abraham talked about it. Moses talked about it. All right, like, this is the Messiah, and you killed him. All right, but he rose from the dead, beating sin and beating death. Our belief that we will go to heaven is because of the resurrection. You know, we wouldn't believe it. It would be stupid to believe that there's a heaven if Jesus didn't raise from the dead. All right? It's because he raised from the dead, we know that we too will be raised from the dead. And our belief in the resurrection affects others. As we see from the disciples, they become these great witnesses. They become these incredible witnesses. You can't help but be that. You're going to be a witness whether you're a good one or a bad one. But you're going to be a witness. Your belief in the resurrection affects others. I, there's a great little story I found. Uh, there was this earthquake in Armenia in 1989 and um, killed 30,000 people. Uh, but there was, during this earthquake, kids were in school and this father ran to the elementary school and it's just collapsed. All right? and there's, everybody's trying to help everybody. So he is there by himself just pulling off rocks, uh, 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 pulling off rubble, not hearing anything. He's hoping to hear little voices. You know, underneath the rubble, he hears nothing. And he refused to quit. He'd been there eight hours and 16. 30, he was there 36 hours straight, pulling off rubble. And after he pulled a big rock away, he hears a little voice. All right? And he, uh, he calls out to his son, Armand, Armand. And the voice answered him, Dad, it's me. All right? And the little boy added these little words. I told the other kids to not worry. I told them if you were alive, you would save me. And when you save me, they'll be saved too. 
right? Because I promise that no matter what, I'll always be there. I'll always be there for you. And there's some great truth to that. He knew if my dad's still alive, if my dad's still alive, he'll save me. If my dad is still alive, he'll save me. All right? And if you're with me, you're coming with me. <laughs> and so there is the truth of this. If you, those old boys, like, we're going to go try to go our own way. We're going to go out the other way. We're going to cut through this other way. It's like, mm -mm, mm -mm. better stay. Better believe in my dad enough to stay with me. And that is our belief, too. We believe that we say, if Jesus is alive, we believe he'll save us. But we were saying, uh, Billy Graham uh, had a couple of statements about this. Um, when Billy Graham was asked, you know, like, uh, like, hey, I, you know, Jesus is dead. I don't, why, you know, I don't know why you think he's still alive. And he's like, that's weird because I just talked to him this morning. Um, the other thing he, he would say is, well, how do you know Jesus is, you know, how do you know Jesus is the right religion? And he says, if you come to a fork in the road, all right? And there's Jesus pointing you and telling you the way. And you look at the other guy, and he's dead. Who are you going to follow? <laughs> so here's Jesus saying, yep, it's this way. Thanks, Jesus. <laughs> you know, are you going to listen to the living guy, or are you going to listen to the dead guy? All right? and the, everyone, Muhammad is dead. Buddha is dead. All right? All, every, every one of these little avatars in Hinduism are dead. Joseph Smith is dead. All right? These people are all dead. And Jesus is here this way, guys. And so if Jesus is alive, he'll save us. If Jesus is alive, he'll save us. And if people can believe it, if, even if they have a hard time, like, I don't fully understand God and all this yet, and they're like, you don't have to fully understand that yet. That's going to come in time. Do, do you believe that I believe? Do, do you believe that I believe? Just come with me. Come with me long enough until you can kind of understand who Jesus is on your own. Our faith is not built on the backbone of moral living. Our faith is not built on trying to make sure our good outweighs our bad. It's not built on some vague belief in a higher power. It's built on the fact that we can't save ourselves and that Jesus saved us and that he proved it by raising from the dead. The very last verse we're going to look at is in verse 20. He says, but in fact, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. He's just saying, my guys, it's true. Christ's resurrection is true. The resurrection is promised for you as well. His raising from the dead, <coughs> the first fruits, it's proof that this is this tree that is planted is a fruit tree that is, we know what kind of fruit tree it is now, it is now produced fruit. And that is proof that it's going to keep producing fruit. You don't know, you know, there are good trees, bad trees. You plant a tree and it produces fruit, you know what it's going to keep doing. If you plant a tree and the first season it doesn't produce fruit, the second season it doesn't produce fruit, you'd be like, ah, maybe this is, a, this is a bad one. Chop it down, make some apple wood, we can at least make apple wood bacon with it. All right, but if it produces fruit, then we're like, okay, it's a good tree. It's going to keep producing fruit. And if Jesus dies, and we're waiting a couple days here, but like, that's what seems to be happening. Uh -oh. I guess it didn't work. But when a couple days later, boom, he resurrects. Fruit produced. We're like, okay, now I know this is a fruit producing tree, and it will keep producing fruit. All right, this is the hope that we have. And our role now is to comfort others with this truth, to pass this on to others, to challenge others, to point out this truth. He says, in fact, but in fact. It's not like, oh, well, we, you know, what I kind of believe is, nope, the fact is Christ rose from the dead. What you're going to do with that fact, I can't make you do something with it. But it is a fact that Jesus rose from the dead the dead. And we're going to talk to our kids about it. Okay? We're going to talk. It can't just be coming from us on Sunday morning. Alright? It needs to come from us on Sunday morning. And it needs to be happening in your homes uh, each, every week. And don't wait till Easter. Alright? This isn't a once a year conversation. Alright? This is a continual, constant conversation about how amazing it is that Jesus rose from the dead. We talk to our families about it. Our family should all know that hey, we... I, 
Can't make anybody believe anything they don't want to believe. Our family, I believe that Jesus rose from the dead. We're going to talk to our neighbors about it. Where, hey, where were you this morning? Like, ah, oh, this is busy, busy, crazy day. Oh, no, that was a church. All right, we're celebrating Jesus' resurrection this morning. All right, we're going to talk to our co-workers about it. Not because we think we are right. And this is kind of how the argument has been built out in this world today. That, oh, listen, I'm glad what kind of Christianity is working for you. I'm glad, glad you found this little Jesus stuff. We all got to find something, right? You know, you have Jesus, I have billiards, you know, we all got something. No, Jesus is not like billiards. All right, Jesus all right, it is something totally, totally different. It's not because we think we're right. It's because we think Jesus was right. And Jesus is the one that says, if you believe in me, you will be saved. I came to the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through me might be saved. So I, I'm not here to say that Jesus is giving us a way, an option, a hope. He's saying, listen, I am the way, the truth, the light. No one comes to the Father in heaven except through me. We believe Jesus when he says that we are hopeless without him. We believe that everyone is hopeless without Jesus. Because the fact is, he is raised from the dead, proving who he is and what he did. Worship team, do you want to come up and do one more song as we kind of conclude out? Let you. Uh, did you have two? Did you have two more? One. Two. Okay, we can do two. Let's do two. We're really getting back in with two. I'm not going to like say, let's worship Jesus.